feels uh, like it's a moment in time that's going to be a memorable one for a lot of people everywhere, even the, the youngest. I mean, my, my grandsons are four years old. I'm sure they'll never, ever forget it. In the past, it was not in the era of social media where uh, there is an instant communication of people, like-minded people, where they are aware of what's happening. And uh, governments and authorities no longer can either lie or uh, misrepresent things. People will find out immediately if it's true or not true. They want food, they want jobs, they want electricity, they want basic things, basic needs. And I don't necessarily see that it's going to go anywhere. I mean, we saw these upheavals. Um, I don't know how this compares in terms of numbers. It's pretty com com you know, comparable to, to the Cedar Revolution. That also fizzled out pretty quickly. I do see these manifestations, these gatherings to be uh, different than in the past. They will have uh, uh, more results than in the past. And I am more hopeful, I'll tell you the truth. I have sensed, even in myself, in my social media, I have sensed a support from uh, other Lebanese uh, people, either in Lebanon itself or mm -hmm. expatriates uh, anywhere in the world. And that has united, I think, the Lebanese people in a virtual way, uh, right. together, I think, with the people in Lebanon. And mm -hmm. that moral support, that, uh, that uh, togetherness, so to speak, albeit uh, virtual, I think eventually have results. The isolation, I don't mind so much. It has brought us together closer. We see, but we don't touch. Uh, we don't hug, we don't kiss, but from far and over the uh, uh, technology, uh, video and uh, Facebook and whatever else, WhatsApp, uh, I think it's brought us a lot closer. And I'm talking to my uh, my own kids and grandchildren much more often now than ever before. They were just way too busy for grandma. My kids used to, to kid me, well, what did you do in your, when you were young? You had no TV. I mean, obviously no iPhone, no iPad, no this, no that, no TV, no telephone. We didn't have a telephone, but uh, we managed. So now they have a taste of their own. <laughs> 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 Gabriel Elia, just a plain old Lebanese Jew. You know, actually, I like the moment that we shared together just yesterday before recording. We were kind of going through the steps on how to download Skype on oh, your phone. That was crazy. <laughs> Two strangers are taking the time to explain something like that. And the fast-paced world we're both familiar with, you don't usually have that kind of luxury. My kids tell me I must have had dinosaurs in my backyard. That's how old I am. Well, you're not that old because I... I no, I'm not that old. You're no. only as old as you feel, I guess. <laughs> well, what, can you just take me back to your to your younger years growing up in, in Beirut? Oh, and the beautiful growing up in Beirut. I never left, really. And I'm, I'm writing um, a book of short stories about my youth in Lebanon, in Beirut, and I loved it. But let me take you a little further back a bit now. Mm -hmm. uh, my, in the 60s, let's say, yes. my father used to listen to a uh, barnamish, uh, a, um, a program on the radio, uh, what we call now podcast, uh, a guy called Zanni. I don't remember his uh, first name. But he used to always start his beautiful talk saying, Life is a series of tales and stories and fables and memories. I'm a rabbi and a doctor. I had organized a trip to Lebanon and Syria as it, it was on, I think, 2011, uh, when the war began uh, in, in Syria, when the events began in Syria. I had organized a trip. 
I had signed up over 70 uh, Lebanese Jews abroad, South America, Mexico, mm -hmm. United States, and even Europe. They wanted to come to Syria and Lebanon. Their ancestors were from Syria. Some of them themselves were from Lebanon or, or their parents were from Lebanon. They all wanted to come. I had arranged a whole trip. The trip was supposed to be in May. And unfortunately, the, uh, the, the skirmishes began in the south of Syria in February, end of February, if you remember, was asked to so-called postpone the trip. Uh, the interest, as I said, I had to cap it at 70 people because I said we could have two buses. I could have had three, four buses. Believe me, I had requests from all over the world. Yes, ex -Lebanese, yes. Lebanese who wanted to go back to see their, their home or their parents' home, or the, the beautiful Beirut, Aleb, Hamdun, Falouga, you know, all of those places that they remember as kids, uh, uh, especially uh, during the summer. If I would organize it today, believe me or not, and I would say there is no problem whatsoever, I will have at least 100 people, 150 people. David Daoud, a research analyst this failure is inherent in the system mm. back from 1946, 1943. Uh, the sectarianism that was always there, the patronage systems. Mm. Yeah, it kind of, you know, the civil war and the collapse of the old order and the restructuring in 1991 kind of brought that to the fore and let, let the current criminals pick up. But these, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. these strands were always there. So Bashir is part of the problem, right? The Jamails are part of the problem. So, mm -hmm. so to hear someone saying, Kilon yani Kilon, but we need a leader like Bashir. No, you need uh, you need an anti-Bashir. You need an anti-Nasrallah. So you see that these... Uh, I, I don't want to speak on your behalf, Go but ahead. I'm going to assume you mean that this is an inherent flaw in, in the way Lebanon is built. Yes. And that it goes deeper than just a... Uh, it's not just a sectarian issue. It's a Lebanese problem. Yes. Identities take time to build. Like many other Middle Eastern identities, Lebanese is not an organic, natural identity. We were first uh, on Rue Georges Picot, mm -hmm. uh, a beautiful, huge building, a pink building that stood out. And the main attraction to the building was that downstairs there was the Iceman, Rashad. Oh. And everybody <laughs> would come to Rashad. And we, we lived right in the same building, right on top. And when we were really young and we were not allowed going out, we used to have a cellar. We had the yes. uh, the little basket, and we <laughs> send the, the the basket all the way down, and Rashad's uh, employee would know, and they come out and they take the money, and uh, they knew exactly what we liked. I see pie festo, or chocolate, or vanilla, or whatever. Right. <laughs> and he would send it <laughs> straight up. In 1948 was not the best of years, and. Uh, I still remember angry mob demonstrations straight down uh, Rue Georges Picot. And we used to be at my grandmother's and I really wanted to go out and see everybody, you know, all these people moving by. Yes. <laughs> and my mother wouldn't let me and I was very angry because they, they used to shoot out, uh, you know, left, right and center. She didn't want me to be out on the balcony at all. She yeah. prevented me. And of course, what they were saying uh, stuck to my, my head. I mean, it's things that uh, scared us uh, uh, up till now, actually. Uh, I, I feel uh, quite emotional when I think about it. Palestine Glebna, Yehud Glebna. And how, how old were you, Gabrielle, in 1948? Four years old. And you, so you, you have this memory from back then. Oh, I mean, it's just in my head, like it's nothing can erase it. It was a scary thing. In 48 also, somebody put a bomb and it exploded in the staircase of my grandparents. And uh, it was a three-story building. It was downstairs. But our bedroom, my brother and I, was right near that staircase. Nothing happened to us. 
but it was uh, scary. Uh, there oh. was a huge, big explosion. I still remember being in my in a crib, uh, and uh, it was an, uh, it had metal bars, and I still remember touching the bars, and they were hot from the explosion and all that. And my mother running in, and grabbing me and picking me up and rushing me out there. These are not things that one can forget that easily. Uh, Gabrielle, was this a was this a target against your family? It was against my grandfather at the time, yeah. What was his position in Beirut back then? He was uh, like a, a, um, a banker. He used to uh, lend money. I guess he had a few enemies around. I have received so many uh, messages via my social uh, media platforms. Lebanese uh, wanting to know more about the Jewish community that existed there and saying, please come back to Lebanon. Lebanon belongs to you as much as it belongs to us. There is, I think, a feeling in Lebanon of many people, especially the millennials and the younger people. They may have not had a personal experience with the Jewish community in Lebanon. They have heard about it, they have read about it, and they are yearning and really thirsty of of wanting to know more about it and wanting to meet the people that live there. Of course, there are one or two few that uh, that um, are skeptical about it, but yes, mm-hmm. they're very curious about it. Within the uh, community, the tension was always felt. As, as mm-hmm. a matter of fact, I uh, wrote about 10 years ago a book and I called it The Tightrope Walkers, because this is exactly what we were. You know, uh, with the least little wind, we would go one way and then straighten out and then go the other way and not know. So the tension was felt throughout the community on a daily basis. It did not stop us from living our life and uh, growing up and loving our youth, you know. This sort of uh, moment in time, which almost seems, in a way, you, you said it yourself, the tightrope. Did you feel like this was a short-term experience that you would be able to navigate, but that there was doom on the horizon? There was doom on the horizon constantly for all of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm talking about the Jewish community in there. But it didn't stop people uh, like my uh, parents, fam- uh, uncles, uh, cousins to uh, get involved and uh, be part of the uh, community council and organize the community in yes, many yes. ways. It was a, a, ter- a very, very well-structured uh, community, extremely mm-hmm. well-structured. I'm really proud of it. We had our schools, we had the uh, our uh, our uh, clinic uh, with a nurse uh, and a doctor uh, to to see to the poorer people. We uh, we had a, a beautifully organized uh, structure, uh, socially, legally, with the rabbi, and uh, you know it, it was very very well done. I mean, my our parents. I'm going to speak in in the sure. um, plural here because I'm <laughs> talking everybody in the community was yes. very keen on making life as easy as possible for us kids. And mm-hmm. uh, this I really appreciate up till now because I think I had a jeunesse dorée, comme on dit. Uh, yes, it's yes, a beautiful yes. golden, golden youth. We had the experience that we could never, ever have had anywhere else in the world at the time. So my father was a member of the rabbinical tribunal of the three rabbis, that's the, the you know the Jewish uh, Jewish uh, court consisted yeah. of three rabbis. It was the chief mm-hmm. rabbi Rabbi Shrem Shahud Shrem, mm-hmm. uh, was Rabbi Yaou Atiye, uh, who was the rabbi of the Sanai Aknis, and my father Rabbi Abraham Abadi Hakam Abraham Abadi. So they were so they were performing a wedding in one of the nights in Magen Abraham, mm-hmm. with their rabbinical garb. And uh, a picture was taken uh, uh, of them as in any wedding, you know, they take pictures for the album. Somehow that picture made its way to uh, the Lebanese uh, magazine, not Paris Match, I don't remember the name of it. That picture made itself there with a whole article and a caption under the picture saying, these are the Zionist agents. 
helping Israel, which is an absolute lie, but that's what it was. As you know, uh, when you have your picture with a caption like that, you're basically a target. <laughs> that picture with the article and the caption is was the impetus for my family to decide it's time for us to leave Lebanon. Although we knew and we were conscious of the insecurity and the tension surrounding us, they made the everyday uh, happening uh, happy and uh, joyful within the, uh, the society, within the group. Yes. You know, I think this is something magical that Lebanese parents do for their children. They give them a sense of joy even during the most absurd moments Absolutely. in recent history. Exactly. My family, uh, on my mother's side, we come from Der Amar. Mm -hmm. But on my father's side, uh, we come from Damascus, from Syria. By the time he came in, uh, he, it was 1918 with the French mandate. He came from Damascus. He was born in Damascus. He was born in Damascus. I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he became Lebanese eventually, right? So from 1918 onwards with the French mandate, he was uh, there. He went to the Lycée Francais in Beirut and uh, mm -hmm. uh, continued with uh, whatever there was. But he was really very community oriented. He, at one point in the 1930s, uh, he was a muhtar. And he mm -hmm. dealt with all the documents, papers, uh, whatever needed to be done for uh, uh, to record uh, marriages, births, uh, yes. deaths, yeah. whatever, you know. So when I grew up, he was still uh, trading. Uh, he, he wasn't a Mokhtar. He was a Mokhtar only for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then he left and he went to Japan. Oh. Uh, and uh, during the war... He spent the war in Japan. He was there in 36. He went back in 39 to get married in uh, Lebanon. And on their way back, uh, on their way to Japan, on their so-called honeymoon, it was 1939 and the war uh, started in Europe. And uh, yes. by the time they got to Japan, they, they got stuck there for 10 years. Oh, so he was in Japan during World War II. That's right. So was I. I was born there. This is fascinating. You know, this is such <laughs> such a Lebanese moment where you, you're saying during the war, and yeah. I have to think, which war are you talking about? No, no, World War II. We're talking about World War II. World War II. So you, yeah. so, so you grew up in, in, in a way, a, a conflict on its own, a separate yeah. conflict altogether. Exactly. So 10 years later, <laughs> in the late 40s, your father decides to return. Uh, yeah, well, not besides, I mean, uh, there was nothing left in, for him in Japan anymore. Yeah. So in 49, he came back. Yeah, we came oh. back. Mm. Wow. 40, yeah, I, yeah. I came back a year earlier uh, with my mother and brother and uh, my, my dad followed us. And, and your father was still committed to being involved in the community's affairs even after that return? Uh, yeah, but... Uh, from, from Japan, he was trading, he was exporting from Japan uh, silk and porcelain and uh, mm. toys. So in, in, uh, in Beirut, when he, was, he got back to Beirut, he started importing. Obviously, he was at the other right. end. Right. And he, he had his contacts still in Japan. What was your father's role in the community in the, in the years afterwards? His own intimate uh, role in representing the community? Well, he was very, very involved uh, in the community, and uh, uh, he was the secretary of the uh, of the Jewish community, the, the Conseil Communal, the commun what, Communal Council, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, as such, he, he looked after education, so the schools, the yeah. health, the clinics, the doctors, the nurses, mm -hmm. the social life. Uh, religious life, he had to uh, to deal with all the rabbis uh, and uh, everything that had to do with the the few uh, synagogues around the area and legal as well. I started at the Collège Protestant. I don't know if you know the school course, in Beirut. Sure, sure, sure. But yeah. one second, not the one that you know or remember. 
at the one, the building was right on Rue Georges Picot where the Starco is now. I don't know if it still is. Is yeah. the Starco building still there? Starco is there. And I think I know you're talking about, I think, the Alliance. The Alliance is across the street. Starco, that's where the Collège Protestant land was. Yes. That's I where know. the school was and that's where I started. And then uh, in the mid-50s, I moved to the Alliance. They moved the, the whole school, the whole uh, Collège Protestant. They sold the land and uh, they moved out uh, to the boondocks, you know. And uh, <laughs> Yeah. So uh, I, I moved to the Alliance and I loved it because I could just walk, uh, you know, and see all my friends walking to school and back and all that. that, that was uh, It worked very nicely for me. That neighborhood has fundamentally changed beyond recognition. Yes. Today, all that's left really is the synagogue. Yes. And it's restored, but it's not being used. Yes. And it stands alone, in a, to a degree, empty, in a neighborhood that has lost its character entirely. Yeah, you're going to make me cry now. Well, <laughs> that's exactly, yeah, but honestly, I can't see it through your eyes, and I, I refuse to see it through your eyes. I prefer the pictures that I have in my head. I was walking in Wadi Abu Jmir and I met a, a very eccentric woman who was screaming and shouting from her balcony. Tlaya <laughs> Ashta. How Lebanese. <laughs> Lebanese. And I look up, this crazy woman with dyed red hair and very obvious lipstick. And then she kind of asked me to go get her khibiz from the Dukene. I'm like, what is this? And I wandered into the building. Mind you, I was younger, but I was curious. And this is. You heard Ashta, you got to say. Mean, not many women have uh, <laughs> lured me in that, in that way, way. <laughs> especially those that are 40 years old. <laughs> but she, she was persistent, and it's a part of the city I did not know well. And this is 15 years ago or so, wow. maybe a little longer. And Wadi Abu Jmil still had a lot of its architectural heritage mm -hmm. intact. Some of it had been, mm -hmm. been demolished. Today, it's gone completely. Her building is yeah. gone. The neighborhood, aside from the synagogue. Yeah, I think the synagogue is the only thing that's... There's a, there's a handful of buildings that were restored. Mm -hmm. Some are mimics. Mm -hmm. clones, of the older ones. But there's no nothing about its original nature left in that neighborhood. Wow. And I met, which I didn't know at the time, mm -hmm. the last Lebanese Jew of the Jewish quarter. Mm -hmm. And it was a very entertaining exchange. She uh, she made it clear that she was Jewish. Yeah. She wanted me to know that she was Jewish, and I did not know enough about that. I deliberately included Wadi Abu Jmil in my tour. Mm -hmm. And I used to include her, Lisa, in the, tour. in the tour. And I would at some point give her food or I'd leave some money for her. Just, And she noticed that I was bringing a lot of foreigners in the tour, so she would sometimes ask me to bring a foreigner. <laughs> and I brought one who was interested in meeting her, a journalist, an American Jewish journalist. And he wanted to meet Lisa for a sure. story. And she was open to meeting anyone. So I take him up. He sits down with her. I translate the conversation sure. for 20 minutes. He's just jotting down yeah. notes. Getting up to go. And she looks at me. She's like, <laughs> And I said, uh, without naming him, yeah. I'm like, uh, she, she's asking for a tip. Yeah. And he's very ethical. He's like, no, no, we, at, at our magazine, yeah. we, don't, we don't tip. We yeah. don't pay for our stories. Said Lisa, mara, mara she? Mm -hmm. And he, she turns, she looks at him for mm -hmm. a while, then turns to me, "Wala <laughs> Yahudi." <laughs> Did she just pass away recently? Maybe several yeah. months ago or so. Well, she passed away actually about a decade ago. But there was right. a there was a piece that came out not too long ago. I believe last summer. Oh, well, maybe uh, that's. It is, yes. Yeah, and it made it seem like she had just passed away, yeah. but it was actually 
Yes, it was a Vice News piece, I believe, in uh, Vice Arabic uh, News. But right. Right. but she exemplified to me the what Lebanon did to its Lebanese Jews, and a woman that often shared her pain openly and would tell us tragic stories of how she survived the civil war and saw the worst parts of it, that she went into hiding herself and that she was unable to be comfortable in her own skin. And I always kept that with me, that this is what happened, that this is what, as Lebanese, what we did to not just ourselves, but in particular to one community that really felt at home. And I worry, I really worry that if we don't properly take care of all Lebanese, including this community, we're really letting go of Lebanon permanently. I am more hopeful, but uh, as a very, very uh, wise uh, approach, always in the Middle East, we know you never know how things are going to turn out. (laughs) You really never can never really plan things because you never know how things are going to turn out because there's so many tribal interests, group interests, family interests, and that goes all over the Middle East. Mm -hmm. However, I am still hopeful because I see the wind of change in major, major uh, Arab states and Arab countries vis-a-vis the world in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Things are changing in countries that we would have never, never expected. We see the wind of change that we would not have even thought two years ago. Right. And so I am I am hopeful uh, for Lebanon and for Syria together. And that is also because, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, the, the patron countries are themselves uh, in trouble, in a sense. They no longer can have an extended arm to meddle in the, uh, in the politics or in the society of smaller countries. It's not the country, it's it's all these other fingers in the pot, you know, all everybody wants a piece of, of Lebanon. It's not the, the Lebanese. Each one wants a, a, a portion of it. Just yeah. leave us be, you know, let us be. There was uh, sellers of... Um, uh, seasonal fruits, right? Yes. At, yes. Uh, uh, everywhere, you know, and and you knew which season it was because the fruits came at that season. Right. Right. Here, you don't know what you're eating, what is in season, what is not. <laughs> yeah. There was no season for a fruit. Then there would be pickles, and you could eat pickles out there or manaish or whatever on the street. It was lovely. It was beautiful and. Uh, then you on uh, on a weekend, for instance, you see the people all nicely dressed and passing by and all that, and you knew there was a big wedding at the Magan Abraham Synagogue. <laughs> so you'd follow just to see maybe the, you'll get a candy or something. So, so you have vivid memories of a crowded neighborhood that's that's lived in, that is alive, and the synagogue is functioning. And, and you know practically everybody, and right. you, you know your obviously you know your classmates. But I don't only know my classmates; I know their their brothers, their sisters, their fathers, mother, grandfather, grandmother, and I still <laughs> remember them all. My kids are just astounded. How do you know so many people? A few years back, uh, I decided to draw the map of. Rue Georges Picot, the Wadi, down, up, and all that. And uh, on each building, I wrote the name of the people who lived there. A huge, uh, big map. It's beautiful. There were over 22 synagogues in Wadi Abu Jmil. T- sorry, 22 in Wadi Abu Jmil itself. Itself. And, and there may have been one in the Sanaya. Uh, and uh, that's basically it. Yes, there were so many synagogues in that entire neighborhood. My oh. family and I did not really live in Wadi Abu Jmil. We lived uh, near the residence, not too far. You know, the residence in Hotel Phoenicia? Uh, yes, yes. In uh, Jbel, you know, Rouge Bel, 10 minutes walk to Wadi Abu Jmil. My mm. father himself had the second largest synagogue in Beirut. Uh, It was known as Midrash Eliyahu, named after a a former chief rabbi of of Beirut, Eliyahu Chabie Zetune. 
my father was the rabbi of that synagogue. That synagogue, I remember, was built, I think, in 1966, 65, 66, uh, it was built. Uh, it was new. It was new. It lasted only for four years because in 71 we left. I don't know how long it stayed open. Mm -hmm. Once the Civil War came, I think people, but yeah, it was a new synagogue. I remember it. I was a little kid. Um, yeah. was built. My father was the rabbi. He was the second largest one in Wadi Abu Jmil. These other small synagogues that you're referring to, were these simply private functioning temples? I mean, I never knew that there were 22 in, in Beirut. I, I had no idea. I thought there were even fewer than that throughout the country. I did not know that it was such a large number. Were, were these just sort of... Uh, R rooms, so to speak, or just like a private room for prayer? Well, uh, they were uh, they were small, correct. As I mm -hmm. said, one that, that was built, I think, in 1965 or 66, Midrash Eliyahu, yeah. uh, that my father was a rabbi, that was, that was a large one, small, mm -hmm. one, but that was a formal synagogue. It had a I... shape of a synagogue and a play inside everything. It was a formal synagogue. Right. Uh, Many other ones were also smaller. There were some, uh, not private places, but there were synagogues that were known uh, by the name of the family that sponsored them or opened them. We have, for example, Knistel Men, which was a much smaller place uh, mm -hmm. on that same uh, passageway uh, in, in, um, in Wadi Abu Jmil. You have, you know, Knist Espanol. You had the synagogue of the Spanish uh, exiles who came centuries ago, and you know you had um, you had many of those. You had uh, uh, known as I think the place the Knist El Bondi, the family Bondi that was in charge of it. All those places were smaller places. Some of them were fully uh, looking like a synagogue, uh, but they were definitely smaller. You had the one of Sanaya, which is a full synagogue, also. The other larger synagogue that I've seen is the one in Pamdun. I think trees are growing inside at the moment. A very large synagogue, correct. Yeah, I, I mean, probably on par with Megan Abraham in terms correct. of size. Correct. That very was large. also my, my father was the rabbi uh, uh, during summers uh, in Pamdun. When we left Lebanon, we left in September, right from Pamdun, we left. Wow, so from Pamdun straight to the airport and then out. Correct, correct. And how old were you in 1971 when you left? I was almost 10. Is there any memory of that kind of slide into the abyss at the age of 10? There is, of course, definitely. I have uh, two memories. Uh, one of them was during the 67 war. On a Sabbath, I remember very, very vividly, two tanks were stationed at the entrance of Wadi Abu Jmil on either side, from the east and from the west. And we were going into the synagogue uh, my father holding my my hand and my older brother hand, and we were stopped by uh, used to be Fir'at the Satash, they used to be known. I was that was like the police in a long station wagon, uh, uh, you know, car. Uh, if I remember, it was color brown, something like that. Uh, and, and there was a tank. There was a tank stationed at the entrance. And we wanted to enter, and um, the police was very respectful to, to us, I have to say. Mm -hmm. They immediately asked for a identity card. And my father said, you know, on the Sabbath, we Jews are not allowed to carry things in our pocket. And that's correct. We don't carry money. We don't carry identity. We don't carry anything. So, uh, and my father told him, you know, I'm the rabbi, I'm the hacham of this, of this knis, uh, and this sharia, he told him the knis, uh, and, and, the, and the police was very, very respectful. He basically kind of saluted us, saluted my father, he says, Tadal hacham, ahla wa sahla. That to me uh, 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 meant uh, we are here to protect you. We are not here to barricade you. We're not here to, you know, protect the city from you. I felt it was more a protection for us. I think that the government had sent the military to make sure that the Jewish community is, is protected and is not being attacked by hoodlums and, and thugs. Anybody entering Wadi Abu Jmil needed to identify themselves. Tfadal Hacham, I've never heard that before. It's nice to actually hear what it sounds like because I hear it in Hebrew only and then you would hear Arabic in a, in a sort of only for Muslims and Christians or, or any other group, but that sort of bridging Arabic and Hebrew together is quite nice. 
yeah, that, 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 that's how we spoke, you know, that's how we spoke and that's how we spoke, you know, they, yeah. the police uh, knew that he was the hacham and he called him the hacham. Faddali hacham, faddali hacham. So that's a positive uh, memory yes. that I have. A yes. negative one that I remember was uh, like a year before we left. The Jewish community, we all knew that the civil war was coming because you cannot have an army within a, within a country, it becomes a fifth column. You cannot have paramilitary uh, people in the city. We knew, the entire Jewish community knew that Lebanon's end was coming sooner or later. And that's why many of the Jewish families left a week, five to 10 families were leaving almost every week. was born in 52 my father was born in 53 your dad's a lawyer during a time of lawlessness yes it's something he's kind of shut out and moved on from mm -hmm. so getting him to open up about that has been so he also has not shared that with you not really about his yeah his... he doesn't really talk like any every time i talk about it, he's like that's the past just right yeah he's very much attached to the united states you know to yeah. to the his you know the jewish aspect of his identity he really doesn't talk about did your mom work in uh mm -hmm. when she, what she was an artist she was an artist. Yeah, she yeah, she she's yeah, she's still an artist now. She well, she doesn't do it actively now. She runs her own gallery and I guess kind of sells mm -hmm. art, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you wonder these are sort of thoughts out loud that their professions reflect their attitude towards Lebanon? I think their professions reflect their attitude towards life in yeah. general. My dad's yeah. much more of a, you know, facts-based, uh an analytical, mm -hmm. you know, data-driven type of person and my mother I don't Clearly, see Lebanon is a bad investment. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Let's but, but let's the, kish, as yeah. they say. Yeah. Is that the let's, phrase? Let's, let's kish. kish. Yeah. Uh, and my mother, uh, I mean, in general, she's just she's driven. I think more by her atfi, as they say. She's very mm -hmm. emotional, and, I, and I'm not saying that it's like mm -hmm. a bad thing mm -hmm. or like oh, mm -hmm. someone's gonna say oh, he just made the woman out to be emotional. Like my mom will tell you, she's just she tears up more about things. She like she's driven more by what she cares about, whereas my dad's kind of the hard nosed like. Here's A, B, C, and we'll yeah. move accordingly. But you're growing up mm -hmm. in America, yeah. post-war yeah. environment. You have a father mm -hmm. who's shut that story yep. out and has moved on. Yeah. I'm sensing your mom has never had that experience with you where she said, don't go back, mm -hmm. or none of that. I mean, for safety reasons, she might not want me to, but mm. to not associate. So my parents came here and they took, I wonder if this was kind of, you know, the trauma of war and them coming here as refugees, kind of putting their lives and who they are into mm -hmm. much sharper contrast than it was back in Lebanon. For my dad, whatever he felt just ended. And my mom, if she, if it would be safe for her to go, my mom is not a very adventurous person. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah, she's not a risk taker. In some ways she is, but not in that kind of a risk. Uh, if she, she would go back. She would not object to me, you know, linking with Lebanese culture or yeah. uh, she insists on speaking to me in Arabic. I'm impressed by that. Yeah. She insists on she it. She insists on it. When we talk, she, if, if, you know, when we talk, it's in Arabic. You know, you, the moment I met you, yeah. the moment we spoke on the phone, yeah. I had, I really thought you had been there recently because mm. your Lebanese dialect. Oh, that's all the credits to her. It's yeah. perfect. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's all so her that's credit. That's her. That's her credit. She, uh, when I would come home from school when I was younger, um, I still remember she had this big board. I don't know where the heck she got it, but it had all the Arabic letters. Yes. And I had to memorize them. And as you know, it got more advanced, uh, she'd buy me books. And mm. uh, I have like Gibran in Arabic over there, Yesu Abn and Sam, which is one of these books she got me when I was maybe. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Bring it over. So I read this maybe when I was like 10 or 11. Um, you read it in Arabic. Yeah, and I have no idea where she got it, but this is, this is some of the things that she would, uh, yeah, she would have me read to be able to. I did a very fundamental difference, Benetna. Yeah. I know. I have the prophet yeah. as I was a kid. In English. in English. But it was originally written in English, though. That's yeah. true, but even the fact that. Yeah. And I was reading Khalid Gibran yeah. in English. Well, I have him in English, too, somewhere. But, uh... 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. so you have a little, yeah. yeah. There is some Lebanese. Yeah. There. Well, he yeah. didn't identify. He's like me. He didn't identify. So. Oh, but yeah. come on. <laughs> the country identified with him. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, against maybe against it's his, his will. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to go with his individual choices. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but that's all he wrote about. Yeah. yeah. But that's interesting. So you're a kid in America reading yeah. Khalil Gibran in Arabic. Yeah. Because your mom doesn't want you to let go. Yeah. She wants me to. She wanted me to have that door to, to this culture. And my dad wanted. I mean, I, I wonder if how much of how he kind of led me uh, uh, was to just erase what my mom was doing. To, to Right. Now you shared this in private mm. that your parents are not together. Yeah, they're divorced. Longer. Yeah, they're divorced. You grew up though. I'm I'm mm. assuming from what you're saying, you saw both of them, right? Yeah. So when we when we initially moved to the states, it was initially to Brooklyn. Mm. Um, we then moved to Connecticut. My dad did not like Brooklyn. Uh, uh, Too many Lebanese Jews. Yeah, basically, he's like, he, the way he puts it is like it reminded me too much of the Middle East. Right. Uh, so he went to the most an- non Middle Eastern part of the country, that's, Connecticut. That's funny. Uh, that's, that's, you know, ugly sweaters and wasps. Like, I made it all the way to yeah. Brooklyn. I'm going to go ten more feet. Ten more feet. To, yeah, flying. exactly. To Darien. Uh, so yeah, we moved to Connecticut, um, and when my parents divorced, they didn't move that far away from each other. They were like mm, maybe mm, mm. a few blocks away. I and see. they so were being between the two was fine. Was yeah, yeah, I could, yeah, you know, yeah. I could go to whomever I wanted on any sure. particular day. It sure. wasn't, yeah. You grew up though. I'm guessing mm. curious about this country because your one parent is at least offering mm. you literature, yeah, in a language you're not using. Yeah, I mean, you're in Connecticut. Sure. I I'm using. I was using it with her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but was there any curiosity about Lebanon beyond her curiosity? No, it actually was kind of a nuisance when I was a kid. In oh, that, like, oh well. Nuisance the way a kid is forced to learn another language? It was even that. I think it backfired in the sense mm. that it it gave me the tools to have a, a window into the Arab world. But what I saw wasn't something I liked, particularly as a Jew. Particularly when what I'm hearing from my mother, like, it's all just stories. They're nice stories. They're cute stories. But they're stories. Whereas I'm living a life in America. I'm living a Jewish life in America. Mm. My, you know, the real tangible things in my life are not Lebanese. Um, so the tangible part of me obviously tugged at me more. And I have this intangible, this ephemeral almost uh, world from my mother. And my window into it, you know, Kilmet Yehudim Sabbe, like being a Jew is an insult. And this is coming from your mom or your dad? No, I, this is me. Oh, me this is you. Yeah, this is you, me you. when I'm, you know, when I'm, we had Arabic TV at home, for uh-huh. example, my mom's yeah. house. I'd watch it and I'd see things that were like, uh, or things. So like, it was affecting you personally. Not, yeah. It's, so that's interesting. You were picking up on your own identity. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. It wasn't like my mom would, my mom, it's not like she imbued me with this view to her. No, she wanted me to think like, you know, no, yeah. Lebanon was the paradise for, for, right. I remember one incident, uh, uh, was at the supermarket and, um, Actually, after my dad remarried, stepmother, I'm helping her get groceries into the car, and it's pouring rain, and this attendant outside, like, it's pouring rain. I'm like, you know, can my stepmom just wait until, or, you know, can I wait here with the groceries, whatever, until my, or one of us goes, I was, like, maybe 11, so I couldn't get the car. Right. But I notice he has, like, a Middle Eastern accent. Yes. So I try to relate to the guy. Yeah. Stupid me. I'm like, you know, my friend, where are you from? And he... I was wearing my keep at the yeah. time, uh, and he loses it on me. He's like, ask your, he thought my stepmother was my mother, and he's like, ask your whore mother, you know, you were slaves in my country, you were slaves in my country. And I start, at that moment, I opened up to him in Arabic. I'm like, mm. you know, mm. Mm. Uh, and I also, and Ahlim in Lebanon, you know, I told, yeah. and he just, it, it gets even worse. Wow. So these were kind of like experiences I had where, you know, using this knowledge to try to interact with it, sorry, with the other yeah. side of, of, of the, the divide only led to kind of backlashes. And it, it formed a very negative view in my mind mm. of Arab culture, of the Arab world. And I was, you know, kids are stupid. They see things in black and white. And uh, yeah, it was something that I said, you know, why would I want this? Why would I want to be associated with something where I'm... But you're you're feeling this at a young age. Yeah. Because 11, you're still... I mean, this is almost like an innocent interaction yeah. that can have permanent sure. reflection. Is there any point in time where the politics of the region factor into this kind of story? Where you're seeing it mm. not necessarily as a child whose stepmother is being mistreated sure. and you're mm. being looked at in a hostile yeah. way against your own sure. I mean, it's nothing you can do this yeah. is, and he's obviously 
prejudiced and yeah. discriminating against you directly. And this is a bit odd. Eleven years as old. a child, yeah, yeah. It's almost like a waiting for that mm-hmm. to happen. Is there any? I mean, you're watching the media. You're seeing horrible slogans. Sure. You're hearing them. Are there any moments where the politics of the region influenced how I view things? It's when the troubles are happening, right? That's when you're. That's when they're. I, that's when you're. They're easily recognizable aside from the average person, right? Because mm-hmm. in day to day life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's nothing to identify one or the other. Mm-hmm. So the politics of the region make that kind of a story even worse. Yeah. To a degree, no, of it's course. It's not like sympathizing with him for his silly, yeah. naive, you know, racism. Yeah. That he that you blame him more in a yeah. way. Yeah. Everything I'm, whether I'm reading it, you know, when I'm reading these newspapers, references to Jews when they do come up are not, not favorable. Uh, there's you know Holocaust denial. There's you know there's these different things that touch on me as a Jew, where I'm like, this is clearly not my culture. Then can I ask you a sensitive question? Go ahead. Is there anything within you that's torn at that moment where you want to reach mm. out to somebody in that language that you mm. know your mom gave you? Yeah. And had things been different, mm. it's the language you would you would speak probably be speaking. Lebanon. Sure. You'd probably be living there, or yeah. you would have had a, a different experience altogether. Yeah. That he is preventing you mm. from being Arab mm. at that moment. I don't know if I ever saw it that way. I think for me it was more of a, a childish innocence, mm. right? That I have this tool, this language that I can use to connect to different people. You know, I was a friendly kid. You know, you wouldn't yeah. guess now with my bitter, jaded, uh, you know, demeanor. But uh, <laughs> I thought, this, you know, this is a tool that I can use to connect to these people that somehow I never viewed it as me. Right. It never was. That's interesting. So it was, it was really practical. It yeah. Wasn't beyond. Yeah. That. Just like, you know, how I would associate with a kid on, on, on you know, on, uh, on the playground. Like, oh, we have a shared interest in this or that. And here's this person who like, oh, well, we have this shared language. Right. Uh, not that it's like, oh, you, you know, this is my identity and you're keeping me out. Was it as impersonal as English in that sense? Like you don't really care whether or not the person speaks the language. I mean, I think just... English is actually it's interesting. I, I view English as much more personal to me. Yeah. Interesting. Like English resonates with me. I love I love the English language. Arabic to me is it's just a language. It's not I don't view it negatively or positively. It's just I think but it's not mine in, in so many conversations yeah. I've had about relationships sure. in Lebanon I've never heard this really where the favored language for emotion yeah. and nostalgia yeah. is English yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, I even more than Hebrew this has nothing to do with Lebanese versus Arab yeah this has nothing to do with Lebanese I don't even yeah this is just I the way I I mean we're a separate uh, ethno-religious group I would consider myself a Lebanese Jew insofar as there is a right, an R-I-T-E, within Judaism that is Lebanese Jewish. So it's not a national well, identifier. Well, this. I didn't, I didn't so in, in, in the sense that you have, you know... I've never met... I, I don't know. I, yeah. Let alone don't know many Lebanese. I mean, I, I'm not speaking for anyone but myself. Yeah. I don't know how others would identify. But for me, I, I've given a lot of thought to my identity because... Both parents born in Lebanon. Both parents born in Lebanon. Fled Lebanon. Fled Lebanon. Lebanon. You're born there. Yes. And you are an American citizen. I'm an American citizen. Right. So that's clear. Yeah. Right? If you're not a practicing Jew every mm. day, you are practicing on your terms. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm very traditional. You Tra- know, I yeah. keep. I keep a lot of the traditions. I have a kosher kitchen. I. You right. Know, as you can see, you, you noticed my. Uh, as you call it, the, this is something, right? The, the talit and the tefillin. I, you know, pray every morning. <laughs> Mistakenly, uh, I thought the tablecloth. The tablecloth. Yeah, no, the, the tablecloth was not holy. The, yeah. Um. So, so you are the Jewish thing is non-negotiable anyway. Right? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's it's like saying, "Am I David?" Right. It's exactly. It's, it's intrinsic yeah, to who I am. Right. And no one's forcing you to wear a star no, of David no, on you. This no. is you yeah. exerting. Yeah. In fact, it would be the other way around to take it off. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But the Lebanese thing. Lebanese thing, look, to me, again, how I would say I'm Sephardic, right? Within the Sephardic, you have Iraqis, mm. you know, if like sub rights of mm. the Sephardic right. You have the Iraqi right, you know, mm. the Moroccan. Mm. The, mm. I would, I'm a Lebanese Jew in the sense that I am part of that sub right of Sephardic Judaism that is Lebanese. So you see your Lebanese Jewish identity through Judaism. Yes. Not through, not through Lebanon. Lebanon. Exactly. And my traditions as a Lebanese Jew differ from those of a Syrian Jew or from an Aleppo Jew or, for, or you know, from a Damascene or Aleppo or Moroccan. I see. So it's really almost like one word. Yeah. Lebanese yes, exactly. Jew, exactly. As to, Lebanese yeah. and Jewish. You're yeah. not Lebanese Druze, Lebanese yeah. Maronite, no, Lebanese I'm, Sunni. Yeah. You're a... Lebanese Jew. One word. One word. Something very nice happened today. 
Um, we just met. Yes, we did. A few yeah. hours ago. It was my pleasure, too. <laughs> and you suggested something, which I'm glad you did. You suggested you'd pick me up, and before we do the recording, mm-hmm. you'd take me to Purim yep. service in the synagogue. Mm-hmm. And you made it very easy for me to understand what Purim is. I oh, hope I'm, so. Am I, I saying it right? Purim? It's Purim, but yeah, you can... Purim. Yeah. <laughs> Purim. And you also let me kind of understand the... That sort of like the rift, if you will. Mm-hmm. Ashkenazi, Mizrahi, mm-hmm. Sephardic. Rift is maybe too hard of a word it's here. It's a divergent, uh, just divergent right. You know, divergent religious right. Even within a synagogue yeah. that you would have... Sephardic mm-hmm. prayer, and you'd have Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi prayer. prayer. And these are things I don't really mm-hmm. know much about. And you walk me into a temple in the suburbs of D.C., yes. out in Potomac? <laughs> Potomac. Really, I mean, not close to... There aren't many Sephardim in the area, so <laughs> yeah. we got to take what we can get. <laughs> we took a 45-minute trip mm-hmm. from D.C. out to Potomac mm-hmm. to your preferred synagogue. Mm-hmm. We go inside, and I swear to you, I've never seen this before. First, <laughs> no one told me Purim is Halloween. It's essentially, yeah, Jewish Halloween. It's <laughs> Nobody shared this information with me. So I walk in, and I see somebody dressed up as an imam. <laughs> yes. Well, first you saw George Washington. First then I the saw, imam walked that's in. That's true. George Washington. You're right. George Washington is a Syrian. Yes. The Ooh. imam was a Persian. Ir- <laughs> the imam was Persian. The rabbi was Iraqi. The rabbi was Iraqi, yes. Yeah. And the rabbi said something very funny as he approached. He said... Uh, I think it was to you. Yeah, he said almost like uh, "ahon Arab or oh yeah, because it was you, me, and uh, it's all yeah. the Arabic speakers. Yeah, because you and me and Mark were congregating in the hey, same area. What did he say exactly? He's like all the Arabic speakers are in one area. But he said it in Arabic. Yeah, he, he said, uh, or maybe he said to you a phrase in Arabic, and I forget yeah. what he said exactly. But he's Iraqi. Yeah, with a very Iraqi yeah. way. Yeah. And he's like, oh, Lebanon. <laughs> Lebanon. Yeah, and I'm like, what is going on here? This has never happened before, right? So literally, George Washington, the Syrian. Yes. You. Dressed as a wasp, as I normally am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm at the edge mm-hmm. watching the Middle East pray. Yeah. In Halloween gear. Yeah. In Hebrew, too. Right? In Hebrew. And when's the joke going to happen, right? <laughs> That's true. And then, I mean, this don't. This is not Go meant please. to be offensive. It looked like George Washington was taking out the Constitution. Yes. <laughs> but it turned out it was... The Purim story, yeah? The, the Miguel Atester, yeah. During, yeah, it's like the, the scroll, uh-huh. right? I'm like, are we going to recite the amendments? The, the, the Constitution, Bill of Rights? Like, no, no, this is right to left. <laughs> This is an older constitution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The first constitution. The first one of the first. <laughs> and it was it was it was very magical to hear this rhythmic prayer in at least I think ten percent I picked up. Mm-hmm. And these are just words sure. that overlap. The rhythm sounded Arabic. Mm-hmm. It did to me. Well the times. Sephardic pronunciation is much closer. Right. Like we pronounce the I and the Het, the you know, as as yeah. as anyone else in the region would. And it was it was very Middle Eastern. Yeah. I don't I mean, I, first, I've never been to a Purim service, mm-hmm. but I've never seen so many diverse Middle Eastern mm-hmm. uh, people. Sure, within one synagogue. Within, yeah. within anything. Within anything, okay. Within anything, yeah. yeah. Most of these communities are uh, Syrian, Lebanese, Egyptian origin. Mm. Uh, they all pretty much pray the same. Uh, there's n- yes, there is a difference between uh, Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews. As you know, Ashkenazi Jews are the Jews from Europe, Eastern sure. Europe, yes. and uh, mostly Eastern and Northern Europe. Sephardic mm. Jews are from Spain, uh, Southern Europe, Italy, Turkey, uh, and the Middle East and North Africa. Mm-hmm. The difference between between these two communities, major communities, is mostly melodies, mostly the melodious part, mostly the intonation. The content is pretty much 95% the same, but mostly is the melodies and the intonation. But we also have differences in a, in a way of life, in a philosophy of life, and things like that. Uh, it, it is, uh, you know, on, on uh, standing on one foot, as that expression goes, Arctic Middle Eastern Jews are much more laid back. You know, Ma'alesh, Alabok, 
Okra, you know, uh, <laughs> where where Ashkenazi Jews are much more uh, much more uh, uh, anxious, uh, much more uh, you know punctual, uh, much more European uh, in, in that attitude. Our prayers, if you go into a Middle Eastern synagogue prayers, mm. you're going to realize that the melodies uh, are very very Middle Eastern, based on the makam. Uh, on the Arabic maqam, uh, you know, the, the the music scale, and not based on the European do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, you know. If you, if you have gone into a um, Middle Eastern Orthodox church, um, either the Armenian church uh, or, or the Greek church, mostly the Armenian, the Armenian one, I would say, and also the Middle Eastern uh, Orthodox church, not the Catholic, but the Orthodox Church. Mm. You, if you close your eyes, if I, I mean, I would do it. I, I would think I'm also in a in a uh, you know synagogue, although they're not using Hebrew. It could be Latin, so or, or Armenian. The melodies are very, very, very similar. <laughs> I mean, having lived in that region for over 2,000 years, I mean, the, the development of, of Middle Eastern Arabic music, a part of the Jewish, uh, you know, the Jews took a great part. Uh, uh, in Iraq and Baghdad, it's very well known that the, the, the Iraqi music was developed mostly by, by the Jewish community. Right. Uh, in the beginning of the century, in the 1920s and 30s and even 40s in, in Baghdad, 30% uh, of the population were Jews and they were the master musicians. Non-Jewish Iraqis learned music from the Jews. Uh, and, and and that is also in, uh, in, in Egypt uh, was a significant part. You know, Leila Murad was, was a Jewish act, uh, actress and singer. Right. Yeah. You know, the Jews were part and parcel of that region for, for thousands of years. My dad became secretary of, uh, of the uh, community, but uh, and his office was right there, uh, right out, out, I mean, within the courtyard of the synagogue, you know? Not the building of the synagogue, but the courtyard of the synagogue. On one side, it was his office. Then there was a big salon uh, where they used to receive all the uh, uh, great, uh, I mean, uh, the people they, they wanted to honor in there. Mm -hmm. On the other side, there was the clinic and the, a small chapel as well. I know what you're talking about because I've, I've been lucky. In the last 15 years, I've taken thousands of Lebanese and tourists to Wadi Abu Jmil. Mm -hmm. I, run, I run a history tour in Beirut. Oh. And that's been, that's been my job for nearly 15 years. And I always made it essential. I always made it a point to include Wadi Abu Jmil and reach the gates of the synagogue. Yeah. And, I, and I emphasize this point because... Today, Wadi Abu Jmil is a fortified security zone. Oh. It has been locked up completely. Because? Well, the former prime minister, Saad Hadidi, he, his residence is literally above the synagogue. And they cordoned off the entire neighborhood where you cannot even approach the synagogue without going through checkpoints and security. Oh. And the Sarai, which is still there, Sarai, yeah has become its own compound. So people literally cannot approach the Grand Sarai. So it's an unfortunate situation. Wadi Abu Jmil has been locked up. Oh. But, but I always made it a point, and I ran through many problems to do this, to make sure I had permission to approach the synagogue. But you couldn't go in through the gates? Could not go in for, for a number of reasons. And okay. the, first, the first is that when I started giving this tour, Megan Avraham was in the same condition that you described in 1975, yeah. meaning that it was wartime. No roof, yeah, 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 completely yeah. damaged and ransacked, all the marble, yes. oh, all the and, beautiful wood, everything is gone, right. yeah. And trees growing inside and almost oh. uh, 
a, a relic of the green line of the Civil War. Yeah. But then years later, it was refurbished. It was renovated entirely and locked up. But I still made it a point to literally approach the synagogue and try to bring that neighborhood to life. And it's mo the most astonishing, uh, the, the most shocked people were Beirutis that did not know the history of that neighborhood and also did not know that there was a synagogue in the heart of the city. But they don't even know that Lebanon had a Jewish community. They don't right. know that Beirut had a, a fantastic, dynamic, uh, yes. lively community. And That's it's why almost... I say, you know, I am a Lebanese Jew because it sounds like an oxymoron. It's not impossible. I mean, how can an Arabic speaking person be Jewish kind of thing, you know? But right. yeah, we were all like that. Of course, we felt that we were in Beirut, but we felt that we were a city within a city. But mm -hmm. uh, it, it didn't mean that uh, we didn't, uh, we were not allowed to go out of it. Uh, uh, I mean, it wasn't a ghetto. It was never a ghetto. So we, uh, for instance, I uh, when I finished uh, at the Alliance, I went to the Lycée Français um, des Garçons, so near the museum there. I don't know the, the name of the area there. But I used to take the tramway uh, along Rue Georges Picot, all the way, go through the Burj, uh, all the way up Rue de Damas, all the way to the, to the Lycée Francais. We had friends there who were not Jewish. I mean, we, ha we had the, a few Jewish friends uh, at, at the Lycée, but uh, most of them were uh, from different other uh, faiths and um, uh, other communities, which didn't stop us from befriending them and uh, sharing with them uh, all the fun and games that one could share uh, um, when you're a teenager. <laughs> we, we used to go to the, to the different beaches, of course. We, we went also to the Bain Francais, uh, Saint-Georges, Long Beach, uh, Sporting Club, uh, yeah, I was part of a, a group. Uh, we were we were uh, competing against others uh, in swimming, for instance. Yeah, and um, no, it was fantastic. We had we had a, as I said, a, a golden youth. The way I looked at it, of course, we knew we were always conscious that we we had something else. We had we had our own problems, but who doesn't? You know, I even the way you're describing it, the tram, that to me is such a romantic. I, I I've <laughs> only seen photos of this tram. I've seen a few videos. I loved it. Oh it's... my God, the sound of the tram, ding 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 ding, and it goes down. <laughs> it wakes you up early in the morning, and you know it's there. That's a, that's incredible. And you yeah. would literally, you would you would use it for your childhood, for your schooling. You would... uh, of course, they yeah. say you can't walk. It's very far. Right, and you'd yeah, hop in the tram. Way too far. Yeah, 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 definitely. Did your father, at any point, and, and as far as you can remember, did he feel like something was wrong? Definitely. That, yeah, and what, what, can you maybe just take me back to that a little bit? I know it's it's a it's a more emotional chapter, but did did you feel like your father was facing an imminent threat? Definitely. I was there in 1971. That summer, I spent a month there. I had a great time, as I always did, uh, recharged my batteries of affection and tender loving care with my parents and family, <laughs> and hated the surroundings because I could feel the changes. It, I used to go there every summer, you know, and uh, I, I could feel that things were changing from 65 onwards, 1965 onwards. Uh, there were many more people with arms, uh, weapons, uh, Kalashnikov. Kalashnikov had become a, an everyday word on everybody's, uh, in everybody's vocabulary. <laughs> Who can live like that? Then I wanted my parents to leave the country and they would mm. hear mm. of it. In, in 71, uh, my father knew that he was, uh, uh, that somebody, he was under surveillance and he, yes. had, uh, he had asked for protection from the Lebanese security and an agent was appointed to accompany him wherever he went. One day, uh, it was a Monday, September 6, 1971, 
the agent did not show up and my father is waiting, waiting, waiting to go to the office at, near the synagogue and the, yes. uh, the guard didn't show up. My father went anyway. And as soon as he went downstairs, out of the door, these two guys uh, or three guys or whoever forced him into the car and nobody had heard of him since. And that was the end of that. But by then I wasn't in Beirut, I was here, I was back here. I had just come back. My mother didn't want to tell me because she was expecting him to come back. She couldn't uh, understand what the story was and everybody was on the lookout for him. And so I heard it from my uncle the next day. My uncle read it in the New York Times and he called me to ask me, what is this true, the abduction? I said, what are you talking about? So I, I took a plane and, uh, and flew to Beirut. We were refugees in a sense, and we had to seek uh, asylum in a different country, uh, mm -hmm. which at that time was Mexico, because my brother was already living there. He went there and he got married and he, he immigrated there. And my father had sisters in Mexico for decades before that. So that, that was the impetus. But that we saw that we, we, we saw the civil war coming as more and more guerrillas we saw in the streets of Beirut, again, wearing khaki, having manifestations. We realized that they're tipping the balance of power and a civil war will take place. Built within Jewish identity is a sense of always being in exile. Yeah, you could be there for thousands of years, but your prayers daily are, as you may have read today, you know, in our, in our prayers. Mm, mm. It's directed not just towards a, and these are ancient prayers. This isn't some kind of modern Zionist invention, as some would like to claim, but these are prayers as old as, you know, the, the diaspora itself. That is prayer. That's, that's, that's prayer. This prayer. is religion. This is yeah. God. Yeah. Would you go as far as mm. saying that that was literally limited to, limited to religion mm. and that the Lebanese Jewish experience tra turned into something like that. The Lebanese Jews left Lebanon not because of a desire to go to the homeland, sure. but they felt Lebanese. I can't speak for everyone. Uh, but Let the, me ask you from your own, yeah. your own two parents. Sure. Did your mom, in your mind, mm. have that kind of relationship to Lebanon? Lebanon? Where, where these old, old prayers mm -hmm. that everyone knows took at least a back step towards just feeling at home in Lebanon. Yeah, I would say with her, yes. Mm. And my mother, I mean, my mother's... you have like, both experiences. I do, so, I do. Yeah. And they're kind of interesting contrasts in that my, yeah. my mother's an atheist. She's mm. very committed in, this, in some senses to being Jewish, but she's also an atheist. So yeah. to her, the prayers are like, whatever. She never made the effort to learn Hebrew. I don't think she feels that tug. Um, and she never went back to Lebanon. After. For safety reasons. If, if she, I think right. if she could, you know, get over her fears, she would go. Yeah. Um, it was never like, you know, it was never a sense of, I don't want to go back there. Uh, but yeah, I think her nostalgia, her feelings, her emotions are definitely much more towards Lebanon. Uh, that's her experience that, that remains real to her. Um, and I think because of her lack of identification with religion, mm. yeah. um, Lebanon is more tangible than ancient prayers. The song that epitomizes, uh, Lebanon and Lebanese society to me is uh, Marhabtain from uh, <laughs> from Sabah, you know, Marhabtain, oh Marhabtain, Wayne, on a head the beaky Wayne. Let me just interrupt you. I've never imagined hearing a rabbi singing this the way you're doing it. <laughs> well, sorry, I, I, I didn't you know, interrupt. I, I, am, I, yeah. I am a lover of Arabic songs. From Sabah to Adi Asafi to uh, Um Kaltoum to Farid Al Atrash to Fayrouz to Abdul Wahab to Abdul Halim Hafiz, uh, all of them. I, I, I carry in my uh, iPhone over 3,000 songs from all of them. But what I'm saying, my Habtain, because she mentions in the song all the names of people from different communities either a Christian, uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim Shia, Muslim Sunni, even Christian Maronite and non-Maronite and Greek. And so that really epitomizes uh, the Lebanese community when it lived, when it lived peacefully and in harmonious way. I said uh, to the president of the community, I said, I've got to see the president of, of the Republic. I've got to go and see Suleiman Frangier. And he managed to get me an audience with him. 
Wow. So I, I went to Sleiman Frenji. <laughs> Oh, this is incredible. <laughs> yeah, crazy as it, as can be. Why did he accept to see me? Because he, he knew my father personally. He had known him, him in high regard. And uh, and he, he talked to me with great, great simplicity. But of course, I mean, he, he's a politician. And he said, well, I mean, I can't uh, see myself doing anything uh, here because things happened. Uh, and uh, most likely uh, coming from a neighboring country. He never said Syria, you know, and that my dad was the not likely on Lebanese soil, so he, he couldn't do very much for me at the time. Yeah. But, I mean, I appreciated the fact that he accepted to see me, listen to me, and I tried not to cry. And uh, anyway, so... Uh, yeah, he said, of course, if we can do anything, of course we will. Uh, he's a Lebanese citizen and uh, highly regarded, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so on my way back to uh, Montreal, I stopped in Paris. And uh, and there I managed somehow to, get, to go to the Quai d'Orsay, which is the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Beautiful salon, all gold, gorgeous <laughs> and all that. I mean, uh, an area fit for uh, for a king. And here I was asking them about my father. And then they said, uh, well, uh, they uh, they will try. And uh, so far they've asked. Uh, and the Syrians said they have no idea who they're talking about. But then uh, they, uh, they added, uh, well, uh, we can't do very much because your father, after all, is not even a French citizen. So I kept uh, up with the president of the French Senate at the time. It was Alain Poer. I went also to the Capitol in Washington and presented my plea to the Senator Jackson at the time. And uh, I wrote left, right and center to the Red Cross, to the Amnesty International, to all humanitarian associations for their help. The worst thing or craziest thing, I wrote to Hafez Assad. Not that he answered me or anything, but I did. I was completely crazy and I wanted the whole world to know of uh, my story. And uh, I, anyway, nothing happened. Uh, after that, I shut up completely for 25 years. I could not talk about my dad for 25 years after that. I couldn't even talk with my children. They knew nothing about it. And this is what, why, you know, eventually when uh, they started asking questions and I was able to, to talk about the, the whole situation and the, the circumstances and details, I wrote the book, The uh, Tightrope Walkers. I hear anecdotally there are from 30 to 50 Jews in Lebanon. I don't know if this is true or not. But, but I, I do believe that I think if, uh, if the synagogue will open part as museum and part as usable synagogue, and if the political uh, climate in Lebanon was, uh, was, uh, was stable, you will have a lot of visitors who, who will maintain probably ser- a daily service there just by having it open. I think the first step would be for the government to have an inauguration and invite uh, p- dignitaries and people from all over the world. I think if that happens, that place will be packed with at least a thousand people on that day of inauguration. Be like the opening of the synagogue and a kind of a welcoming message that yes. are open for business, so to speak. The, the only problem is, as far as I know, there is no working community there. My sense is that the Lebanese Jews living in Lebanon, they were attached to Lebanon and life was good, so why leave? I sense, I yeah. sense from the few conversations yeah. I've had that the attachment to Lebanon was the most important okay. factor in that list of, yeah. in other words, knowing that they were also insecure mm-hmm. is as important. Sure. But the attachment was, the attachment explains why Lebanon is the only country. Whose Jewish population rose. Exactly. Sure. Aside from Israel, yeah. the only Middle Eastern country that had an increase. Yeah. Well, Not this necessarily year... in its domestic yeah. Jewish population, but its general Jewish but population. But I think that's even more fascinating in that yeah. Syrian and Iraqi Jews found Lebanon as a refuge. And exactly. I, I, 
I, in Boston, actually, uh, I met an Iraqi Jew who's speaking to me in Lebanese. I'm like, where do you know Lebanese from? And he's like, well, I grew up in Beirut. Wow. So he was one of those, you know, those, those yeah. crossovers. And you meet, right. again, also like not many, but a handful of Syrian Jews who also Lebanese accents. Why? They grew up in Beirut. They never got citizenship because, you know. They, and some of them did. Yeah. The Safra family became yeah. Lebanese. But I think it was uh, the time. I think the Zilcha family is from Iraq. The Zilcha are Iraqis. And they yeah, became yeah, Lebanese. Yeah. They had a bank in yeah. Beirut. And, yeah. The Jews did have This is something my dad tells me. You know, Yeah, life was good. But like, how many times can you be told as if it's a good thing? Like, When you haven't tasted that sense, in the sense of, like, let me put it this way. I lived in the north. You know, grew up in Connecticut. Uh... When I was, I you went Tripoli. Yeah, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> there was a Jewish community there back in the yes, day. Yeah, yeah. Mizrahi family. Yeah, yeah. Um, but at some point, you know, my mother moved to Florida, mm. Uh, mm. where you know, I became increasingly unique. Mm -hmm. Um, I never felt I've never felt that I've had to hide my Judaism. I've never felt that my Judaism was a barrier to my Americanness. I've yeah. never felt yeah. that I have that there's a glass ceiling on me in the United States because I'm Jewish. Right. When I went to Lebanon, I first I didn't feel at home. I didn't feel like I was returning. There was no. It was like okay, here's this country. I'm gonna explore it. Can you take me back the date? The, the, uh, this the is, year. This like, was 2008. 2008. Okay. So this is the first yeah. time I went as a tourist and exploring the country, but my identity wasn't welcome. And when I talk to many Lebanese, my identity as a Lebanese Jew is welcome on Lebanon on, on their terms. Right. And that I have to shed my ethnic identity and mm. that feeling of being just, you know, anonymous. Like you feel in a sense, there's a certain sense of home there that you don't stand out because this belongs to you. There's a book that you mentioned, mm -hmm. a book I know, a book that I actually used for my own thesis sure. after meeting yeah. Lisa, uh, The Jews of Lebanon mm -hmm. by Kristen Schultz. And I remember how that book ends. Yeah. And then you told me something quite personal yeah. if you don't mind just well yeah i mean uh I, I the book ends by mentioning um one of the last boys born to the jewish community uh, and it puts the date at 1988 um i think that that's about me uh i think she got the timing wrong it's 1989 uh but i don't know of anyone else who was born to the jewish community in lebanon around that time uh we were we were one of the last families. We were kind of one of the stragglers to leave. So, unless it's born in Beirut, I was born in Beirut. I was born at AUB. You're born in AUB. I was oh, born at, in AUB. So at AUH, uh, presumably at the hospital. Yes. For, yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. And apparently, like I don't know, this was during the uh, elimination war. Yes. So, Between Jaja and all. Yeah. So the, apparently, the my my parents tell me like the bombs were coming down as the as they were driving to the hospital. Where were your parents living then? Uh, I believe it was in Wadi Bujmil. They were still in the Wadi. Yeah, okay. I think so. Yeah. But the Wadi Wadi Bujmil was a no man's land. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was like right in the center between right. the the. Did they stayed in downtown. I'm pretty sure. I mean, they. I don't know if they moved. I know they were in Beirut. They were not. Uh, okay. Yeah. How long was it before you then moved? I was six months old. Six. Months. They had planned on actually leaving before. Um, uh -huh. So the original family name was Arazi. So okay. Arazi is sorry. That's your original family. original family name. So the that last name. I mean, to someone familiar with the Jewish community, uh, it's like Goldstein or you know Horowitz or it's like very obviously Jewish. Um, we were worried that we would get stopped, and they got documentation with this last name Daoud, which is more ambiguous. So they to, they changed. They changed the last name. And this this is before. I mean, how. This is as they were preparing to leave Lebanon. Oh, the preparation yeah, yeah, yeah. they changed the name. Because they wanted to be able to get out with no with no problems, not being stopped at borders, not being recognized as Jews. Uh, it wasn't exactly a time to be, you know, a yes. good time to be recognized as Jewish, not by Lebanese or by Syrian authorities. So you became Daoud Daoud by accident. I became Daoud Daoud by, by a very unfortunate accident. Yeah. And now uh, it, it makes for good humor for a lot of people. Uh, uh. <laughs> so, so you're by birth Daoud Arazi. David Arazi. David. David, yeah. Okay. There's a Dawood Dawood, but no relation. The Amal guy, yeah. absolutely no relation. Oh, so you, you are now David Dawood. Yeah, I'm David Dawood. Yeah. And you don't you would never go by Dawood Dawood. No. Okay. Yeah. But originally David Arazi. Arazi. Yeah. In fact, I, I thought your last name was Shatah, not Shatah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> now, can we keep the conversation though? <laughs> yeah. 
of course, of course. So I, I thought your last name was Shatah, not Shatah. Do you write yours with a ta or with a ta? With a ta and uh, without the shadda, without the shadda. Exactly, without the shadda. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah we, without the, the 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 accent, so to speak. I have to tell you a a a, a uh, what I recall the the patriarch of uh, of the Shatah family that lived maybe two three blocks away from my home. Mm. It was a very very funny man. Oh really. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, that, that that's what I'm saying. His he used to he used to pedal. He used to pedal. He had like a small little carriage, and he would walk down the street and he would sell things. Uh, wh- one of the things that he would sell was knives. He would sell knives and he would oh. sharpen them. <laughs> and 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 the way he would sell the knives, he had a, a chant, and I'm gonna s- chant it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so wait he's actually that's his selling strategy that's how that, he did it <laughs> that, that's how he did it. and people would laugh of course because it was funny you know basically he who, he who has a fight with his wife or had a had a disagreement with his mother-in-law let him come and buy a, a knife and settle the the differences <laughs> of course that was a a uh, a funny way of 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 uh, people would laugh and he would laugh also but that was the way uh, in which he announced his entry into that street whenever he was selling but you yes know, part of me wishes he was re- related to me that would be a great uh, a guy in the family <laughs> the knife peddler with a yeah. sense of humor yeah exactly exactly so that that's that, that, that that's what i remember of the shatah family uh, that's hilarious the, yes yes Had you talked to me during those 25 years, I would not have opened the... uh, I wouldn't have said anything. I I couldn't. I just could not talk about it. It was one huge nightmare that I could not shake off. Was that the last trip you made to Lebanon? Uh, Yes, in 71. Oh, so since then you have not returned? No, no. And sorry, Gabrielle, when, when did you find out about your father's ultimate fate? Were you were you in Montreal when in you 73. learned? In 73. Okay, so you, you, you were told in Montreal at, at no, that point. No, I wasn't in Montreal. During that trip, I, I uh, was talking to uh, uh, other people and, uh, and they told me that uh, for sure he didn't last very long. He, he had a heart condition. And he needed the, his medication. And this is why I was telling the Red Cross Amnesty International, do something. He's not going to last, you know. Yes. And uh, in fact, he didn't last. I think. And then I was begging Hafez Assad to give me his corpse. Did your mom remain in Beirut afterwards? She remained till 76. Okay. She, thought, she, she thought she's going to leave the door open. Maybe he'll come back. Maybe, maybe he'll come back. Yes. Maybe he'll yes. come back. Finally, you know, the, they had to flee in, in 1975. My sister was there also still, and she was married, and she had a child. So uh, they uh, uh, went to Hamdun because uh, it was untenable in Lebanon, in Beirut. And uh, our house was uh, completely demolished. Uh, at the time, we, w- we were living uh, in Antari, r- right across mm. Uh, mm. from... Um, the president's, uh, you know, uh, Sharafuri used to have a beautiful yes, uh, of pal- course. palace or, yes. or house. We lived right across from there. When my mother saw that there was one big hole instead of a building, she decided, okay, it's time to go. And it was 1976. So by that point, Wadi Abujmir had become part of the Green Line and it was too it dangerous. Was, and I, there was I mean, that big tower, El Mur or something. Yes, of course, it's yeah, still there. I, it's yeah, I don't, I don't know it. I don't. I just know it through hearsay. I don't even know what they're talking about. Right. Well, this yeah. was a sniper's den. I mean, it was yeah, exactly. Yeah. And my mother, like, also with all of that, like, she's um, very American in her own ways. And mm. I think if she, it's interesting. In a recent conversation I had with her, uh, I don't know. I just kind of like got sick of the nostalgia with her. Like, you know, yeah. and and. Like, mom, you're not Lebanese. Like, come on. Like, if you went to Lebanon now after 30 something years, where would you fit into the, the you know, she's like, yeah, you're, you're, you know, she thought about it. And she's like, you're right. You know, it's a totally different country. I meet Lebanese people now. And like, it's like, we're talking 
from two different worlds almost. Like she's talking from an old Lebanon that doesn't exist yeah, anymore. Yeah, but that that is the familiar Lebanese yeah. experience. Yeah. Where Lebanese that have been away for a long time start realizing that the country has an yeah, change. change. But it doesn't mean that this is a country that they don't want to go back to. Mm. When my mother passed away, the family, my, my brother, sister, and myself decided, uh, in spite of everything, to write both their names on the same stone. And wow. we had closure then there. We didn't have his body. We put her name and we yes. put his name as well but without the body. And uh, the rabbi said that's acceptable. She, she remained abroad, I'm guessing, the entire time. She did not return to, to Beirut either. No, that was it. No, no, no. Yeah. no. Nobody returned in, no. None of the community uh, members went back to, to Lebanon. Those who stayed had other uh, different reasons to stay. Uh, either mm. they married uh, or, or uh, whatever. But th those who left, no, I don't think they, they came back. They went back as tourists eventually now recently. But I love the pictures I have in my head and I want them to remain there. I will okay. not go back to Beirut. For most people, I think if they're just going to go with their instinct, I would say, you know, I'll give you an example. I was at um, uh, Shabbat uh, lunch table it was a couple of months ago with my friends and they're Syrian and their son-in-law is Lebanese. Mm. And so me and him and like, I guess his two daughters are at the table and my friend and his father at the table. And like Abraham, my friend says, oh, well, for once the Lebanese outnumber us here. And I'm like, I'm from Connecticut. I, uh, like, what are you talking Don't include me in this count. And his, <laughs> the, the brother-in-law gives me like the most hurt yeah. look like, what do you mean you're not Lebanese type of yes. thing? And that's the same thing. Yeah. And he's yeah. Ne he's never been in Le he's never been to Lebanon. His right. parents left. He was born in Brooklyn. Right. But he's like he's Le he feels more, I don't I can't ex explain why he feels it more than I do. But for him, it's instinctive. I've I've actually had to sit there and sift through these very different parts of my identity. And I think perhaps because I read a lot, perhaps because I just was more of a curious person. I don't know. But going through that active sifting i'm like yeah this is what matters and this is what mm. this is what's helped form me and this isn't you know mm. this is the wheat from the chafe so to speak and i don't mean to like be to be little lebanese no, no, sure, in any sure. way, but but it, but it just it does add to the point which is two lebanese jews that yeah. i've never met yeah have differing yeah interpretations of that what it is of their, yeah, of their sure. own personal sure. story yeah and you're in effect you should be more nostalgic and you're yeah, I'm not. I'm an anomaly. I'm, I'm definitely yeah. an anomaly. As we say, inshallah, and I'm ready with my suitcase. Uh, the moment they're telling me for the inauguration of the Magen Abraham Synagogue, I yeah. will come and I will bring with me a group of people. Definitely. Uh, oh. Again, uh, let's not forget that the, the great temple of Solomon in Jerusalem was built from cedar of Lebanon, yes. from the cedar yes. of Lebanon. Right. Uh, uh, the, the king of Tyre at that time uh, brought many of his workers and brought cedar wood to build yes. the, the temples. So that, you know, we the relation between the Jews and, and, and the Middle Eastern uh, population, um, that relationship existed for at least 3000 years. Uh, and I'm hopeful that it will rekindle itself again, especially in Lebanon. Lately, I've been addicted to Lebanese TV, addicted <laughs> TV series. I've been watching Mithl al-Amar, Wain Kinti, and they have beautiful, handsome, talented actors like Rita Hayek, Joel Darer. These are today, yeah? With Sam Saliba, <laughs> Carlos Azar, he's my hero. <laughs> These wonderful performers. The producers are unbelievable. The screenwriter, this one specifically, Claudia, Claudia Marchalian, they're yes. the best ambassadors a country could wish for if the country could, could be rebuilt. I think I have one memory. It's ridiculous. You have one memory? I think I have one memory. I remembered we had a dog in our house. Okay. And I tried confirming this with my mother. Uh -huh. uh, I think when I was like 18. I don't know why it popped into my mind. Like, Mom, did we have a dog? When we were in Lebanon, and she looked shocked. She's like, "How do you know that?" I'm like, "I don't know. I in my mind, I remember there was like a cage huh. with a little dog, and it was on a dresser or something." She's like, "Yes," and I don't know if someone had told me, like, if my dad when I was younger had put that you know memory in my head, but she said it was pretty accurate to what was there in that dog. Like a pet dog. Pet dog. Something you shared with me mm. beforehand. 
her disappointment in your dating choices yeah oh yes uh i mean she's she in that regard she's very typically lebanese i'm sure you can <laughs> so if you don't mind share as much as you'd like uh, about why you're stuck being lebanese against your wishes well my mother <laughs> has made it very clear that her preferences for my you know future uh wife are <laughs> lebanese and if she's willing to compromise uh maybe a syrian malish anything outside of that very limited sphere to her is <laughs> compromising one step too far <laughs> I'm stuck. But, you know, love my mother. I've never... I don't give her the veto on, on these things. Yeah. Sure, Not yeah. the typical Jewish boy in that right, sense. Right, yeah. right. But she would prefer a Lebanese She would, wife. but she she yeah. can come to terms with whomever it is. I like her flexibility is literally just one other... Yes, exactly. Maybe, so, but it's like, that's also like a, a shifty, hey, like a shaky maybe. It's uh, a very Lebanese shaky yeah, maybe. Exactly. Actually, more to the point, you have to marry a Lebanese exactly. wife. <laughs> David, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure, absolutely. I am hopeful uh, and I am optimistic uh, that eventually um, the entire Middle East will uh, will open up and uh, will come to the realization that we all live in one world and we all are humans created by the same God. And though we may have different uh, faiths and different beliefs, but we are all here on this earth to create a just society. It's an honor to have this conversation with you. Shukran Hacham. Sharafna o Tikram Yarami. Whether you go to Brazil, to Panama, to Mexico, to Brooklyn, to uh, to Montreal, to wherever you go, in Europe also, in Milan or in Paris, you'll find the same setting on the table. You'll find the Labne, Labne with Zetun, the Tarwi Asuba. Uh, you'll find the falafel, you'll find the kibbeh, the bule, hummus, you name it, everything. At, and uh, everybody humming, Feruz songs, Zuruni, etc. and all that. They, we are still living Lebanon uh, from afar. I wish I could sing. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll read you the song. Maybe you know it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>